Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So today's video is going to be the second video that I'm making on the case of Lindsay Clancy and the death of her three children, five-year-old Cora, three-year-old Dawson, and eight-month-old Callan. In the last video, it was still very early and it still is very early, but we talked a lot about the possibility of postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis playing a role in this case. We talked about how Lindsay was undergoing an extensive therapy program for her postpartum anxiety as well. We talked about how the entire situation went down, which I will summarize in just a second, but we were also left with so many questions about this entire thing some of which have been answered. So as a reminder, Lindsay Clancy worked as a labor and delivery nurse who was suffering from postpartum anxiety and was getting treatment. During this time, Patrick, her husband, was working from home so that he could support her full time in any way that he could. The two lived in a house in the towns of Duxbury in Massachusetts. However, on the evening of January 24th, 2023, Patrick left the house for only 25 minutes to pick up some takeout food, and when he got back, he found that his wife had jumped out of the window and his three children had been murdered. Five-year-old Cora and three-year-old Dawson were found dead at the scene, while eight-month-old Callan was rushed to the hospital where he later died of his injuries. Lindsay was also rushed to the hospital and she is getting treatment for her injuries and she did survive. We now know a little bit more about Lindsay's mental health, her medical history, and what exactly happened on that day. So we know in the past, Lindsay has been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. In the months before this happened, Lindsay had been keeping journal entries on her cell phone notes app as well as in her notebooks. On January 25th, in one note, she wrote, I think I sort of resent my other children because they prevent me from treating Cal like my first baby, and I know that's not fair to them. I know that. I was feeling so depressed last evening when Cora and Dawson came home from school. I know it rubs off on them, so we had a pretty rough evening. I want to feel love and connection with all of my kids. By December, she told Patrick about her suicidal ideation and told him that she had thoughts of harming herself and at one time she had thoughts of harming their children. So she decided to voluntarily admit herself into an inpatient psychiatric care for several days in early January. Since then, between October and January, she was prescribed, I believe, 12 to 13 different psychiatric medications. However, Patrick said that Lindsay only ever took her medication as prescribed and she was never on more than four or five of them at one time. But either way, she had been depressed and she was on around-the-clock suicide watch, as we know from Patrick being home to watch her 24-7. But according to Patrick, he had left Lindsay at home with the kids many times before and he was never told not to leave her home with them at any point. He never had any indication that she was going to harm the children. He stated that in the days after she was discharged from the hospital, she actually appeared to be getting better. She seemed happy and she was smiling all of the time. She did not seem like she was struggling with postpartum depression or anxiety, at least to the severe extent that she had been before checking herself in to the hospital. Then in her court arraignment, the court outlined the events on the day of January 24th, 2023. So the day started as a pretty normal routine day for Lindsay and Patrick. During that day, Patrick was working from home in the basement where he had an office. Then, Lindsay started the day by taking five-year-old Cora to the pediatrician for an appointment. She had interacted with the receptionist, nursing staff, and the doctor, none of which raised any issues or concerns with her behavior. She was allowed to leave the appointment with no concern, and it was pretty much just your average run-of-the-mill checkup with Lindsay and Cora. After the appointment, she went home and went outside with Cora and Dawson to play in the snow. They built a snowman together and sent photos of the kids and the snowman to Patrick as well as to Lindsay's mother. She texted back and forth with both of them, once again showing no signs of distress or any trouble. 
However, after that, there are a series of concerning behaviors that lead up to the children's deaths. By that evening, Lindsay was on her cell phone making different searches on the internet. At 4.02 p.m., she searched Kids Miralax, which is a medication used to treat constipation. It's essentially a children's laxative. Then at 4.13 p.m., she searched Takeout 3V, which is a restaurant near Plymouth. After this, she searched for Takeout 3V on Apple Maps to see how long it took to drive there from Duxbury. Then at 4.47 p.m., she visited the CVS website. Right after that, she called CVS to ask the manager if they had kids Miralax. The manager told her that they didn't, but she said that they had similar medications. Once again, according to the manager who spoke with Lindsay, she sounded completely normal. She wasn't panicked, she wasn't slurring or incomprehensible or anything along those lines. It was your very run-of-the-mill normal conversation. By 4.53 p.m., she texted Patrick, who once again was in the basement, asking if he wanted to get takeout from 3V. She said that she didn't cook anything because it's been a long day. Now, prosecutors during the arraignment said that this was unusual because they typically get takeout from somewhere closer to home, but this was a restaurant they had been to in the past, so I guess they did know about the restaurant. So, Patrick said yes, that he was good with getting takeout from 3V. So, Lindsay texted him to check out the menu. By 5.06 p.m., Patrick texted Lindsay again asking her what she was going to order, and she told him her order, which was the Mediterranean Power Bowl, and then he told her his order that he wanted the scallop and pork belly risotto. By 5.10 p.m., Lindsay called 3V to place the order. Once again, the hostess said that there was nothing out of the ordinary about the call, it was a totally normal conversation, and nothing about the call seemed to raise any suspicion for her. By 5.15 p.m., Patrick headed out. He said that he was going to pick up the food and then run some errands along the way. Lindsay texted him saying, Pedialax liquid stool softener just after Patrick left. Then, by 5.32 p.m., Patrick is seen on surveillance video in the children's medicine aisle in CVS. By 5.33 p.m., Patrick called Lindsay, but she did not answer. By 5.34 p.m., Lindsay called Patrick back, a call that lasted 14 seconds. According to Patrick, she told him what medication she wanted him to get because, again, he was in the medicine aisle at CVS. Once again, Patrick said that she did sound completely normal, but later he would say that it did sound like she was in the middle of something, but he didn't know exactly what. By 5.47 p.m., he buys the medicine and leaves the store. He then gets to 3V by 5.54 p.m. and picks up their food. When Patrick got home at 6.09 p.m., Patrick said that he didn't hear or see Lindsay or his children when he walked in, so he called Lindsay on the phone to look for her and the children. Then he went to the bedroom and found that it had been locked. He was able eventually to get inside, but when he did so, he didn't see anyone in there. But he saw that there was blood on the floor right in front of a mirror, and he saw that the window was open. When he looked out of the window, he saw that his wife was on the ground, laying there with wounds on her wrists and her neck. He immediately ran over to her, and she was conscious at this time. Patrick asked Lindsay, what did you do? And she replied that she just tried killing herself by jumping out of the window. Immediately, Patrick called 911, and during this call, Patrick is heard asking Lindsay where the kids are, and she replied, in the basement. Patrick remained with his wife until emergency services arrived, and from there, Patrick went around the house to look for the kids, and that is when this case gets really, really hard to listen to, so this is a huge trigger warning for all of you. You went into this case obviously knowing that children died, but the way they died and this whole explanation of everything is just horrible, so if this is something that you don't want to hear, I would suggest skipping a few minutes forward or just not finishing this video altogether. But when he found the children in the basement, the 911 operator heard Patrick screaming in shock and agony. 
Cora and Callan were in the den area of the finished basement, whereas Dawson was alone on the floor of Patrick's home office. Each child had been strangled using an exercise band, and when Patrick found them, the exercise bands used to murder them were still wrapped around each one of their necks. Patrick removed the bands from the necks of his children, and he could be heard begging his children to breathe. The entire time, he was screaming uncontrollably and screamed, she killed the kids. Once again, Cora and Dawson were dead at the scene, and Callan died a few days later after being on life support. Just telling you guys that is putting my stomach in absolute knots. I can't even imagine seeing that. I can't imagine it being anyone's children, seeing them like that, let alone your own. And the fact that Patrick had to find them like that is horrible, 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 this whole thing is horrible. Lindsay was also sent to the hospital where she is being treated for several injuries, including several broken bones to her back, including cervical spine fractures, which are pretty bad, and fractures to her rib cage. It was also said that she cut her own wrists and her neck before jumping out of the window. Her defense attorney is claiming that she is now paralyzed from the belly button down and will never regain function to her legs or anything below her belly button but I've seen some sources that state that she was able to move her legs. So in my opinion, we don't know the exact state of her physical condition, even though most articles are reporting that she is paralyzed. But I will say a lot of times defense attorneys do want to gain a lot of sympathy from the court, obviously, as much as they can. So they could be exaggerating this. They could be stating that she's paralyzed, even though she's only very, very weak and that eventually she will get motor function. There is a difference between paralysis and paresis. Paresis is when you're just very, very weak and it's very difficult to move your muscles, very difficult to move your, you know, your legs or your arms or whatever. And then paralysis is complete and total loss of motor function below the area. So it's hard to tell if she has true paralysis or if she just has paresis or if she's in a state of shock. We don't know. Basically what happens when you're paralyzed is that your nerves are so damaged that they're pretty much stopped from supplying any sort of function to your muscles and at that point that cannot be restored. However, there is a level of damage that can be restored after a certain point. There are tests and measures to figure that out. That's something that I would do in the hospital but um, it's not always totally clear if someone is completely paralyzed. There could be some areas of motor function below the level of injury. That's totally something that needs to be looked further into by her doctors. So that's why I'm just a little bit skeptical of saying full paralysis because there is chances of regaining some of that function even if it seems like you're paralyzed when you first get this injury. So I'm not saying that the defense is lying or that they're making anything up or exaggerating anything. She absolutely could be paralyzed but I do think it's a little bit early to be coming out with all of that information and saying for sure that she will never get any motor function below the level of injury. If you know more about her exact condition, please correct me and let me know but just off of what I've read and other sources stating that she has moved a little bit, we don't exactly know, in my opinion. After being admitted into the hospital, of course, Lindsay was examined by a psychiatric doctor hired by her defense attorney. While in session with the psychologist, Lindsay called her husband. She told her husband that she killed her kids because she heard a voice and had a moment of psychosis. Patrick asked her what voices she heard and she said that she heard a man's voice telling her to kill the kids and kill herself because this was her last chance. After the call, Patrick noted that she never had once claimed to hear voices and she never had used the word psychosis before, so... That could be, you know, from her psychologist. Those words could be coming from them. It also could be her understanding what she went through. We don't exactly know what that means for sure. Either way, in the court arraignment, she appeared before the court from her hospital bed via video call. The prosecution is arguing that this is a callous planned attack on her own children. 
She said that her previous journal entries that I read earlier show that she was clear-minded and she had given no indications to hallucinations or delusions. They argued that when she was discharged from her inpatient hospital stay, she was not diagnosed with postpartum depression or psychosis, only that she had a prior history of generalized anxiety disorder. Then I also want to mention that when she initially woke up from the hospital, she couldn't speak, so she was given a whiteboard to write her thoughts on. It was reported that one of the first things that she wrote on that board was, do I need an attorney, showing that she knew what she had done. But I do want to highlight that it's reported as one of the first things that she wrote, so we don't know other conversations or statements that were made before this. So I don't want to go and say, like, she woke up and immediately wrote it, you know, the second she woke up. She could have been told what happened before she wrote that. She could have been told that she was in trouble, something like that. We don't know the exact situation around that, just that she at least was clear-headed enough when she woke up to know that she might need legal representation. In the months, weeks, and days preceding January 24th, 2023, the defendant meticulously detailed her daily activities, her children's lives, her mental state, and her medication use. Her writing was clear, precise, and articulate. She never indicated that she was hallucinating, delusional, or had disordered thoughts or speech. In all of her writing, she appears to know who she is, where she is, the date, and with whom she's interacted. She wrote a note on her phone the day before killing the children, stating that she had, quote, a touch of postpartum anxiety, end quote, around returning to work. She wrote that her psychiatrist had prescribed medication to help her. The defendant was initially diagnosed, according to her husband, with generalized anxiety disorder. She was then evaluated at the Women and Infant Center for Women's Behavioral Health in Providence, Rhode Island on December 20th, 2022. There, after an evaluation, she was told in the presence of her husband that, by psychiatrist, that she did not have postpartum depression and that she had no symptoms of postpartum depression. She wrote in her journal that at times she had suicidal ideation in December of 2022, and she also told her husband that she had suicidal thoughts and on one occasion had thoughts of harming her children but she did not write or voice those thoughts after a stay at McLean Hospital. When she had those thoughts, she consulted with a psychiatrist and with her husband, and then she committed herself to McLean Hospital on January 1st, 2023. She was discharged by the hospital on January 5th, 2023, and the hospital did not file any paperwork at that time attempting to have her committed as a danger to herself or others. She also kept meticulous and detailed daily medication logs in a diary that she wrote. She detailed that she had difficulties with each of the medications that were prescribed to her. And when she had issues with those medications, she detailed how her doctor had her stop that medication or wean off of it and then try something else. They were trying different medications to see what would work for her, what would benefit her. According to her husband, she was never on more than four to five medications at one time. And at the time of the murder, she was taking only three medications. And he said, to the police that she always took the medications as prescribed. After her stay at McLean, the defendant appeared to be getting better, according to her husband. She slept well, interacted with friends and family. She went out with her kids and husband to places like the Kingsbury Club in Duxbury, the Charlie Horse Restaurant, the Museum of Science in Boston, the Cape Cotter down the Cape, interacting with her family and the public without any apparent difficulties. She even stayed alone with the children on several occasions without any issues in January of 2023. Her husband asked her in mid-January, are you still having suicidal thoughts? And she said, no. The defendant's parents visited the family the weekend of January 21st, 2023. They interacted with the defendant in person. The defendant was able to run errands while her mom watched the children. She texted back and forth with her mother and there was nothing out of the ordinary about these text messages. In fact, the defendant texted her mother on January 22nd, 2023, to ask how her, home, her ride home went. During this conversation, the defendant's mother wrote, quote, enjoyed seeing everyone this weekend. Nice to see you doing better, end quote. On the night of the killings, Patrick Clancy was interviewed by the police at Beth, Riz Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth Hospital. He told the police that the defendant was having one of her best days. 
She was smiling and happy, and there was no indication that she was going to harm the kids. No one, no one at all, described her as acting like a zombie in the days leading up to the murder or on the day of the murders themselves. The defendant did not take advantage of the situation when her husband left the home that night. She created the situation, and she used Apple Maps to make sure she would have enough time to strangle each child before her husband returned from where she had sent him. The defendant is a danger to herself and others. She planned these murders, gave herself the time and privacy needed to commit the murders, and then she strangled each child in the place where they should have felt the safest, at home with their mom. She did so with deliberate pre premeditation and extreme atrocity and cruelty. Her defense argued, of course, that she was not in the right mental state when she committed these murders. They argue that she was in a state of temporary psychosis when she killed her children. They talked about how she was prescribed 13 different medications, which caused her to have side effects that can be blamed for the postpartum psychosis. But another doctor, who I will note did not have access to Lindsay's medical records, therefore did not review them, stated that he does think that Lindsay suffered from postpartum depression, but he does not think that the medications had anything to do with a psychosis or anything like that. He said, quote, typically we do not see psychiatric medication even when improperly prescribed and prescribed in excess volume to cause psychotic symptoms or homicidal thoughts. What it can do is cause a delirium, a medical state where you start to see psychotic symptoms occur. It may be the case that she had a pretty significant underlying condition and what was seen was a result of the condition itself with medications being increased to try to catch up with the symptoms. He continued by saying, someone can be so depressed that they see life as so meaningless or so hopeless that they view it as a cruelty to allow their children to continue to exist in this world. This is not something where the mother snaps. This is typically a case where following the birth, the mother is exhibiting increasingly worsening signs and symptoms of an illness and then starts to really reach a crescendo pitch of her illness, which culminates in the filicide. Her defense also brought forward what they described as a wish face that Lindsay kept. In the wish face, she had dozens of tiny little pieces of paper, each that had wishes that Lindsay wrote on them. She wrote that she wished for happiness and health for her children. She wished that she could get pregnant again and that she would be able to be with her children. She wished that her three children would grow up to be happy, successful, and healthy. They argued that she did not have a reason to hurt her children. They argued that she did this in a moment of psychosis, not a planned attack. Her defense attorney argued that she is not okay, that she is a danger to herself as a result of her mental state. And I just want to share with you, Your Honor, one of the things that's interesting. When I was in the house, um, I came across a, a drawer that had a bunch of pill bottles in it, and I called the DA and I said, I got these pill bottles, and made arrangements, I'm going to be giving them to them. Um, and it's all the Prozac and the Trazodone and all that stuff. But inside the drawer was this little vase. And uh, I didn't know what it was. It just looked like a little vase to me. And my wife said to me, oh, that looks like a, uh, a wish vase. I said, what's a wish, wish vase? She said, when people write down little wishes and they put little pieces of paper and they put them inside the vase. And there are literally dozens of these little pieces of paper that talk about Lindsay's wish for happiness and health for her children, that she could get pregnant again, that she would be able to be with her children, little Callan, Dawson, Cora, that they would be happy, healthy, and successful. This is not a woman, Your Honor, that had any reason to harm those innocent children. So in court, Lindsay pleaded not guilty as a result of temporary psychosis. The defense claims that she is a victim of a healthcare system that failed to treat her postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. They said that she was and still is extremely unstable and she is emotional, but she cannot express the emotions that she's feeling right now, which is why she appears to be more of a flat affect. And I will say that a flat affect does come with certain 
mental health disorders where you're feeling a lot of things, but it's just not coming across. Now, our society fails miserably in treating women with postpartum depression or even postpartum psychosis. It's Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicaid. Throw the pills at you and then see how it works. If it doesn't work, increase the dose or decrease the dose. Then end up trying another combination of medications. We're talking a relatively short period of time from when that baby was born in October up until January when this incident occurred, Your Honor, that she was on such significant dosage of medication. Uh, Your Honor knows that uh, Cora was born in uh, 2017. It was a very uneventful, uh, normal pregnancy and delivery. No issues afterwards as far as anxiety. Dawson was born in 2018. Uh, again, it was a normal birth. Um, she had no significant issues as far as anxiety. She did have to have stitches and she was sore and that was about it. Then of course, Callan was born. When Callan was born, she ended up becoming depressed, and suffered from a significant anxiety. As a result of which, she consulted with a number of doctors. A number of doctors indicated that she would be able to sleep, she would be able to feel, she would be able to emote uh, once these medications kicked in. And again, as I say, our medical and our society completely abandons women with this condition. It's easy to say, come on, you have a healthy baby, you have a wonderful husband, you're able to take care of your, your kids and your home, you're lucky. Take the pills, you'll be okay. Well, they put her on a number of medications. They put her on Prozac, which Your Honor is well aware, is what's known as SSRI, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Your Honor knows that along with some of these medications, they have the black box warning from the FDA, may cause suicidal ideation, may cause homicidal ideation. She was on Ativan, she was on Benadryl, and then she ended up being told, okay, because she was complaining about the effects of the Prozac, they said, stop the Prozac, we'll find something else. They put her on Remeron. Then they added on Seroquel. And Your Honor, I attached from David Benjamin, the toxicologist, some papers with the submission, and Your Honor can see the side effects that this Seroquel causes. She was having bad thoughts. She was having worsening depression. Her husband suffered through that phase. Her parents were well aware of the fact that she was suffering from this depression and depressive phase. She wasn't sleeping. She ended up, at some point, Your Honor, uh, December 31st, she was on Seroquel. They told her then uh, the Valium would be stopped. She was a shell of herself, no personality, and went to the doctor again. The doctor again prescribes the Seroquel, uh, and then they took her off the Seroquel. And then she went to the doctor, and the, at that point, they, pre they prescribed trazodone, Ativan, amitriptyline, right up to the very end, when she was so bad that she voluntarily turned herself in, if you will, to the McLean Hospital. We know that that's a psychiatric hospital. She was at the McLean Hospital for a period of about five days. Well, at the McLean Hospital, they basically tried to get her uh, off the Seroquel. Uh, she wanted to get off the benzodiazepines. She felt that she was being addicted to the benzodiazepines. She then ends up on Trazodone, Ativan. Um, her mood was terrible after she got out of M uh, McLean Hospital. She still had the suicidal thoughts. As the government has indicated, she even told her husband that she had suicidal thoughts. You think this is something that she's planning to kill these three kids by going and getting a menu? going on to Google Maps or whatever it is and finding out the distance, when she tells her husband she's having suicidal thoughts, probably a month prior, thoughts of hurting her children, they go to the doctor again and she's on the medications, on and off, on and off. This is a significant issue between the postpartum depression as well as possibility of postpartum psychosis that is pretty much ignored. But nevertheless, with the overlay of the SSRIs and the history, and Your Honor has some uh, emails and things that people would reach out to me from all over the world indicating that their daughter had the same problem, that they had the same problem. Your Honor is well aware that many times when people are on Prozac or on SSRIs, workplace violence, homicides, family homicides, this 
is clearly a tragic, which is a word that's used too much in the criminal justice system, but this really is a tragedy, this case. The prosecution said that she had to strangle each one of her children for at least a few minutes each. She had to hold onto their neck and squeeze their necks and look at each one of her children in the face as she ripped their lives away from them. She could have changed her mind at any point within the several minutes that this took place, but she didn't. The children were killed by ligature strangulation. Ligature strangulation causes the victim to become unconscious anywhere from 10 seconds up to a minute. The more the victim struggles, the longer it takes. After the victim is unconscious, the ligature must be held in place with force, squeezing the neck for up to an additional four to five minutes to cause death. Therefore, she had to strangle each of them to unconsciousness and then make sure the bands were squeezing their little necks for several minutes. She could have changed her mind at any point during that time and removed those bands from their necks, and she did not. She knew she needed an attorney when she woke up. She wasn't concerned with her children in that moment. She was concerned with her own rights and her own self-interests when she asked if she needed an attorney. And to some of this, I do agree. I think it is early to tell, but I think just the fact that someone can do this to their children and then plead not guilty is just horrible. In my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, you guys can give me flack for it, you guys can disagree with me all you want, but in my opinion, if you really felt that guilty about ripping your children's lives away from them, I don't think she would be pleading not guilty, but that's just me. Again, it's early in this case. She could be trying to understand what she went through, what she did, and is explaining it as temporary psychosis, and I don't want anybody to take what I'm saying as me not believing her as me saying like, oh, you know, the psychosis didn't actually play a role in it. There's no way that she suffered from that when clearly I think that there is obvious, obvious clear signs of her being mentally ill. No mentally healthy person is going to do this. No mentally healthy person is going to kill their children or children in general or anybody else in general. No one who is mentally healthy is going to do that. But does that mean that she was not in control of herself? Does that mean that the psychosis caused her to do this and that she had no idea she was doing it? That's a question that I guess will come out in the trial because in my opinion, you can be mentally unhealthy. You can be in a horrible, horrible mental state where you just want everything to end and you can plan things out. You can plan what you're going to do, but when you follow through with it, if you know what you're doing, even if you're mentally ill, even if you are in a state that you just feel so horrible, if you know what you're doing, you know that it's wrong. You know that you shouldn't be doing that no matter how mentally ill you are, unless you're in such a state of psychosis where you simply do not know what you're doing and you have no idea what's going on around you and what you are doing to somebody else. So it's going to be hard to argue that in my opinion, but I guess we'll see in the trial. Either way, I think for the most part, she is responsible for the death of her children, and I think that she knows that. This is a really, really hard case. I'm disgusted by this whole case, and I almost didn't want to cover it anymore because of how much it infuriated me finding out these details, that she looked things up to make sure that her husband was gone as long as possible, allegedly. Whether she was in the right state of mind or not, you cannot argue that she snapped. She did plan some aspects of this, whether she was mentally well or not. You cannot argue a temporary psychosis that lasted from, you know, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. Someone doesn't just go into a psychosis for two hours. They don't just talk to people on the phone and sound normal when they're in that state of psychosis. And the fact that while she was killing the children, and I think that that phone call when Patrick said that she sounded like she was in the middle of something, I think that that is when she was strangling her children. And the fact that he said she sounded normal, someone in psychosis will not sound normal. Someone going through something like that and who has no control over their bodily movements and who has no control over what they're doing, they're not just going to answer the phone and 
make their voice sound like something is normal. They're not going to make it sound like everything's normal. They're simply not going to do that in my opinion. They're not going to be able to go to the doctor and take your child in for an appointment and act completely normal. You're not going to be able to talk to, on the phone to a hostess at a restaurant or a manager at CVS and sound completely normal if you're in a state of psychosis. Those aspects of this seem planned to me. The fact that she sounded normal and the fact that She's trying to say she was in a psychosis while acting completely normal. I don't, I, I don't buy it. I think that she is mentally ill and I did give her a lot of the benefit of the doubt in my last video and I do hope she can redeem herself. But as of right now, I am pissed. I'm pissed that when she woke up right away, she wanted an attorney because she was thinking of herself and of getting the least amount of jail time possible after murdering her children. Personally, I think that if I snapped and did something like this to someone I love, even if I was not in my right state of mind, I would want the harshest penalty for myself because I know that I caused someone's life that I love to be over. I did that in this scenario, but in this scenario, Lindsay did that. Whether she was mentally ill or not, she caused her children's lives to end and she knows it's wrong. She knows it's wrong enough to request a lawyer. She knew it was wrong the whole time, in my opinion. As of right now, the judge has ordered that Lindsay stay in the hospital and be held without bail to continue her mental health treatment, but he said that she's not a flight risk, so should she be released, she can be ordered to house arrest. He said that because obviously if she is paralyzed and obviously she, whether she's paralyzed or not, there is obviously like problems with her legs. She's obviously not going to just stand up and walk. So because of that, he said that she's not a flight risk. So that is where the case sits right now. Of course, as more comes out about this case, I will keep you all updated, but that's what we know about the case right now. It's a really, really tough one to talk about because again, I gave her so much of the benefit of the doubt in the first video, but as we're finding out more, I'm really, really, really disappointed. I'm really, really infuriated at all of this, the fact that it seemed like she planned it. And I know that some people are going to give me flack for that once again, saying that like she didn't actually plan it, you know, whatever. To me, this seems like she did plan at least some aspects of this. She was well enough to know that she needed Patrick to be away while she murdered her children. If she was truly in a moment of psychosis, she would have just done it. She wouldn't have planned for the moment that Patrick left. If she truly was in a moment of psychosis, it wouldn't have been that she planned for him to be away. That is someone who knows that what they're about to do is wrong, that she doesn't want her husband to know about it because if she truly, truly did not know what she was doing, she would not be considering whether Patrick was home or not. And that is just my opinion. But that is where I am going to leave today's case. I know that I talk a lot and very fast. I notice it myself when I get very upset, but I am so, so upset with this case. I'm sick of children being murdered. I'm sick of our healthcare system not taking people seriously. I'm sick of it all. But we still need to talk about these cases because maybe something will change. Maybe things will be prevented in the future. Things like this from happening. Maybe spreading awareness about cases like this can stop other ones from happening in the future. If someone else sees the signs, if other healthcare providers take it seriously and understand what can really happen. But that is where I am going to end today's video and now I want to know what you guys think about all of this. Do you think this was a planned murder? Do you think she was in a moment of postpartum psychosis or do you think she was just mentally unwell? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Twitter is where I keep the most up to date with any case that I cover, so make sure you follow me on Twitter if you do want to stay up to date with this case. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.